and um, I just think this is a, a wonderful initiative. So I really want to commend you, Clifford, and the team. It's, it's very inspiring to be here. And I think what's so inspiring for us that work in the, the sector of entrepreneurship or um, employment is that there are dedicated teachers here today that are passionate about coming alongside their learners to really ensure that they can give them the best um, foundation that, that you can so that they can go on to succeed in their lives. So to all the teachers here today, thank you for doing a very critical job that's absolutely critical to the future of South Africa. Um, the topic that I was asked to speak on today is to look at how critical insight passion and good ideas uh, can grow a business. And, um, you know, I had, to, I had to think back many, many, many years ago when I was at school. I mean, roughly, we're talking about 25 years ago when I was in matric. Um, and, and so I thought, what should I tell you today um, that hopefully will be able to inspire you, to give you some insight, um, and, and to tell you a little bit about the good ideas that I get to see every day. And I actually decided I was going to share with you my own personal story um, and, and use really my life as a bit of a case study, which I hope um, will inspire some of you here today. You know, when I was in matric all those years ago, um, I remember thinking there were three huge things that I had to overcome in matric. The first one was, who was I going to take to my matric dance and what was I going to wear? That seemed to sort of obsess me for the first term. Managed to get over that hurdle with no main hitches. The next hurdle was the, there were these matric exams that were just looming at the end of the year that I was just so nervous about. I felt that my entire life hinged on those matric exams. And I also had to make this decision around what was I going to do when I finished school? Because what I chose to do meant that that is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Now, at school, I was a very average, if not below average, student. In fact, maths was completely and utterly horrendous. I was a standard grade pupil and managed to scrape throughs, but I will tell you how I redeemed that later on in life. But the one thing I did have was the most inspiring teacher that was my drama teacher. She was the most encouraging person I've ever come across because she was passionate about the topic that she taught. And all of us absolutely adored her and loved the subject that she taught. And I actually just discovered that I did have a skill at drama. So when I came to finish matric, I was very confused in that final, final term of matric. I wanted to be three different things. I wanted to either be a famous actress, or I wanted to be a missionary, or I wanted to be a lawyer. Now, I mean, those are the most diverse things one could possibly think of doing. And I was so nervous because I thought if, if I just choose the one thing, that's what I'm going to have to do for the rest of my life. Well, the reality is that I got into Wits Drama School and learned all about television and film and really believed I was going to be this famous movie star one day. But the truth of the matter is, over the last 20 years, I have actually identified my mission. And I feel that there's a piece of me that lives out my missionary inclination every single day of my life. In the work that I've done and through setting up organizations and working with entrepreneurs around setting up businesses, you have to know enough about legal entities and what are the best entities to do that. Also being an advocate for causes that I'm passionate about means that in some way I think I'm filling out that fantasy of being a lawyer. And at the third, while I didn't become a famous actress at all, um, what I did do is use unbelievable skills um, around acting and television and producing um, films that I've used throughout my life in terms of giving voice and storytelling around the causes I'm involved in. So just to say to all of your students, this is just the beginning, okay? So getting matric is a huge hurdle, and I recognize that. But you know what? Life unfolds. And life is going to take on many different twists and turns. But I want to say this to you. Be passionate always about your future and analytical and, um, and, and about your past. And what I mean is that things are going to happen to us that are really bad. We're going to fall down a lot of the time. But you know what? Being able to look at it analytically and learning about our failures and saying, how can I do it next time? So never, ever, ever give up. One of the things I've noticed about entrepreneurs and people that succeed in life, failure is something they accept willingly. Because you know what? Life is about the school of hard knocks. It's how we look at those hard knocks, how we pick ourselves up, and how we move and propel ourselves forward. So never, ever, ever give up. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my hard knock 
in life and how it actually changed my entire life. I left drama school and I was involved in um, going around uh, using, education, uh, using drama as a means of education. This is in the very early 90s. Going around to schools in South Africa and Southern Africa, talking around HIV AIDS, environmental issues, but still had that burning desire that I was going to be a soap, a soap opera actress. And I couldn't resist going for an audition with Igoli. I got to the final um, round of the audition. Now I was coming back from a holiday in Durban um, over the New Year's weekend, this is 1994. It was January, the 1st of January, and I was gonna get that job. Driving back, and I had the most horrific car accident. Um, I broke my neck, I was unconscious for a long time, um, and nearly died, and basically had a near-death experience, which changed my life forever. Um, what happened in that moment when I was literally departing this planet, is that my whole la life flashed before me, um, like a fireworks display, actually. And as we all know, fireworks are beautiful for about three minutes, but then they sort of fade into nothingness, into blackness. And what I got out of that message during that time is that everything I was putting value on was great for a certain point of time, but it had no eternal value. It didn't feel like anything I was doing or aiming for had significance. Because what was driving me is, I wanted the car, I wanted the house, I wanted fame, I wanted fortune. But you know what, they're short-lived, and it didn't feel in that moment that it had eternal value. I couldn't take it with me, I can't take the car to heaven, if that's where I was going, I'm not quite sure where I was going, but anyway. <laughs> um, it's not coming with me, okay? I wanted people to go on that journey with me. I wanted my father to walk that road with me because I was so scared, I didn't know where I was going. It was a, and words really feel short in trying to explain this experience. Um, and no one can actually come with me on that when you're facing the road to death. In fact, we're born into this life on our own and we depart on our own. And everything in between is up to us. It's our lives, guys. We've got to have dreams, we've got to have passions, we've got to work hard to achieve them. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I think all of us have the same dream. We want to look back at our life and know that it mattered, and know that we lived out our lives to our full potential. The reality is, is that I made it through. I came out of unconsciousness, I'd broken my neck. The doctors told me it was a complete miracle because it's called the hangman's fracture, where you actually, your dantoid peg gets snapped, um, and most doctors say to me, we say to the patients that are paraplegics, you're lucky because you weren't a quadriplegic. So the rest of your life, you need to be on your hands before God and thank him that you are able to walk. I lost my father two weeks later, um, which was horrific because we were very, very close. Um, and basically I was, well, am I going to be this actress? I've had this whole life, uh, you know, sort of epiphany. And then I did the most ridiculous thing, because <laughs> it took me about a year or two years to uh, recover. I went off to London for a friend's wedding and decided to stay with absolutely no skills. I was determined I was never going to learn how to use a computer, because I didn't need to use a computer. Well, what a shock when I got to London. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> but I want you to remember this. I landed up on a trading floor for Deutsche Bank, with one of the, which is the largest trading floor in Europe. And how did I do that, okay? The one thing I could do was audition particularly well. I was an actress, right? Those were the skills that I'd learned. So I acted my way into that job interview. <laughs> I did all the research on a part that you would always do if you're an actress, you go and research the part. I needed to find out what, uh, what uh, bankers wore. I bought a little suit or I borrowed a little suit. I figured out all the questions and all the things and all the jargon and all the language that I had to use during the interview and I got the job and then felt horrific. So I went to my boss and I said, listen, the reality is I don't know the first thing about banking. Um, I didn't tell her what I got from a trick. Thank goodness she didn't ask for maths. <laughs> <laughs> got through that. But I did say to her, I really am determined. I've dealt with enough temperamental directors in my life to know that 800 men on a trading floor are not going to intimidate me and I want to learn. So to everyone out there, if you're hungry and you're eager to learn and you're going to put in the hours, that's what the employees want to see. And so if you're going to stay the extra mile, if you're going to put in the extra hour, you're the person that's going to be looked at. People are going to watch you. They're going to tag you. And that's basically what I did. I worked 
so hard. <laughs> I ended up becoming an investor relations specialist and getting into deal origination um, in, 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 uh, um, in uh, money market repo, which was just quite astounding. Um, I used to always regret not having studied hard enough at school, particularly on maths. I had to put in probably five or six hours a night after all the traders went home at, at six o'clock. I, I left the office at Deutsche Bank at midnight every night. Uh, so I, I had a lot of catching up to do because maths was not my favorite subject at school. So I'm just saying to all of you guys now, get the lessons down now. <laughs> Listen to what your teachers have to say about maths. You've already confirmed that to me. Um, so don't make the mistake that I made. I didn't pay much attention in maths. Um, but now I've had this whole epiphany and I'm working in a bank and I'm chasing money again. What is wrong with me? You know, when am I actually gonna learn my lesson? And a little piece of my soul died every day. And I was like, what am I doing in London? You know, have I not learned my lesson? I really feel like my life needs to have a purpose. It needs to matter. I came across a friend of mine that was in London and he was leading a course called Adventure of Living, which he had actually discovered in South Africa. An adventure of living was all about how do you find your calling? How do you move from success to significance? Where does my passion intersect with the need in the world? Um, and those were all my buzzwords. So I was like, I've got to do this course. I've got to do this course. So I did it, became so passionate about it. I started leading it in the evenings voluntarily to help young people find their calling and move into their passion. And one of the things that we had to do on this course was write a mission statement. So I want you to take note, at some point in your life, do yourself a favor and write a mission statement because it will be your guiding light forever. It's your compass when you're making decisions. And I wrote my mission statement when this is, goes back 14 years ago. And my mission statement is to be a voice for the voiceless, but to be a bridge between people that have and people that have not, to always have an ear to hear the cry, a heart to respond to the need, and a voice to verbalize that out on a global platform. But now I'm sitting in London thinking, <laughs> so who is Voices? How does this actually work? Um, and a friend of mine that was leading the course felt that we were privileged South Africans that had you know, lived during apartheid in South Africa. This country had given us so much. What were we gonna do about giving back to this country? We're living in London. Everyone was so negative about South Africa at that point. The rand was 20 rand to the pound. And we were like, what if we take a negative and turn it into a positive? What happens if we start mobilizing expats in, in, in London, expat South Africans, um, and do events in London that people like to do, but charge an extra 10 or 20 pounds on the ticket and then send that back to South Africa? Because suddenly on the exchange rate, you kind of really, you know, quadrupling the money that you're raising. Um, and so Starfish was born. We, we thought about who are the people that need the help most in South Africa and, and who, who does the future of South Africa rest on? And it's the youth. It rests on all of you guys here today. And uh, that was our passion. And we realized that so many children in South Africa were, were being orphaned. There were no antiretrovirals at the time. Um, and there was this projected uh, population of orphans that was gonna grow to three million by 2010. And we were really concerned that no one was really looking at the plight of orphans. And so that suddenly where became the voiceless person that I could identify with. Um, a woman came over to London called Heather Reynolds from God's Golden Acre. And she told a story that changed my life forever. And I'm gonna share that story with you today. So never underestimate the power of storytelling, folks. It's simple. Sharing our stories with people moves people. This woman told me that she was working with a social worker in the Valley of a Thousand Hills. It was late one night, she was leaving the valley, and um, this woman at midnight tried to wave down her vehicle, um, and the social worker said, no, we just can't help everyone. Let's drive past. So as she drove past, she just saw the anguish on this woman's face. She stopped and she said, how can we help you? And she said, a friend of mine is dead, and I really need your help. And they walked into the valley, and they walked to a hut. As they opened up the hut, there were three huge, large rats that ran out. When they walked in, there was a woman who was lying dead on the floor. As they moved away the blanket, the rats had already eaten away her feet. And they moved the blanket away some more, and there were three little children just hanging onto their dead mother. And, and, and they, had, they had nothing, absolutely nothing. But as she pulled the children away from their mother, they grabbed at the mother's blouse and ripped off the button, off a shirt, a piece of her fabric, 
and they would not let that go for ages. And they would keep that. And that was the only memory they were ever going to have of their mother. And that broke my heart. And I'll never forget it. I was just, this is crazy. Christmas is coming. They don't have their family anymore. Who's actually going to show them that they cared and loved for over Christmas? And I literally had a, a vision the next day, which seemed like a most ridiculous vision. And the vision was that what if we made memory bags for all of the children in the Valley of a Thousand Hills, and we sewed them, and we filled them with Christmas presents, so at least on Christmas Day, every child got a Christmas present. But more than that, they would always have a memory bag to house a photograph of their mother, um, and just really their identity. But I suddenly thought, maybe that's a really stupid idea. And uh, maybe they need food. And Anyway, I e emailed my friend Anthony, and, and I said, what should I do? And he said, you know what? I was walking in Hamleys the other day and thought, wouldn't it be amazing if those children got Christmas presents? Just go for it. Still working at Deutsche Bank, guys, and very miserable there. But suddenly I feel like there's a purpose and there's a mission that I have. So I start mobilizing. And so this is the other thing. Always verbalize your ideas, your visions. Doesn't matter if they're stupid ideas. You might think they're stupid. Somebody else might go, that's a fantastic idea. I want to get behind it. I want to come alongside it. So don't be shy ever to talk about your ideas or what you want to do. The more you talk about them, the more you solidify your ideas. And so the long and the short of it is, I just mobilized people around London. Women would get together every night, we'd sew these bags. I started fundraising, trying to raise money to buy the presents, trying to do my job at the same time. But even my bosses said, you know, we, something's changed in your spirit. When you come onto the trading floor every day, you've got like a skip in your step. What are you doing that's so exciting? And I really felt that what I was doing, I absolutely loved. I was passionate about it. When you're passionate about something and you throw yourself into it, it's visible, it's tangible. Um, and never forget that. If, if you're selling an idea or you're teaching a class, if you throw your passion into it, people are going to you know, be inspired by it and, and, and walk with you. Um, the long and the short of it is that at the end of that project, we're sending everything off to London. I did the maths again of counting up the money that I'd had to raise for the presents. <laughs> and was 340 pounds short. And I was like, damn. Anyway, it was midnight. I went to sleep. I said my prayers. I'm like, you know what, God, if you are up there, there must be enough accountants up there, there in heaven that are going to work a plan. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> and woke up the next day, was convinced that, you know, the miracle had happened, counted the money. I was still 340 pounds short. <laughs> damn. <laughs> Again. But I got a phone call um, from a girl that had heard about the project in London and she said, you know, late, late last night my husband and I were talking about your project and what we were going to buy each other for Christmas. And we thought, you know what, we'd rather not spend the money on each other this year and we will uh, give you the money to, to buy Christmas presents for the kids. Can you swing by and get a check? And of course the check was for £340. So, <laughs> so sometimes creative accounting does work. I know you don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but that was the beginning of, of, of Starfish. I, I left London, um, came back to South Africa and realized that so many South Africans really wanted to make a difference, but didn't know how to engage. This is a time where uh, CSI departments didn't really exist. People were starting to grapple with what do we do, how do we engage, how do we build up our community. How many of you know the Starfish parable? Some of you. I'm going to quickly share it with you because I think it's a, it's a parable that's relevant to every one of us today. Um, and, and this is the reason why we called our organization Starfish. It's based on a modern day parable about an old man um, that goes for a walk along the beach every day. One day he's going for a walk along the beach and he sees a young woman dancing in the distance. But as he draws closer, he realizes she's not dancing, um, but she's picking up starfish and throwing them into the sea. But he looks along the stretch of the beach and he sees that their millions have been washed up. So he taps her on the shoulders and says, young lady, what are you doing? And she says, well, I'm picking up starfish. I'm throwing them back into the sea. The sun is coming up. The tide is going out. If I don't, they'll die. And he says, I realize that. But how can you possibly make a difference? There are millions out there. And she thinks about it, bends down, picks up a starfish, throws it back into the sea and said, well, I made a big difference to that one. And so we believed, even though there were going to be three million orphan and vulnerable children, and the, it, it just seems enormous, but what happens if each and every one of us in South Africa identify our own starfish and go, we're going to come alongside and just pick up one child? Eventually, we were going to be able to turn the tide on AIDS. And so we mobilized ordinary individuals, 
we, all, we, we um, mobilize little kids to have cupcake sales. We mobilize sporting people, not just to run the comrades for their personal best, but to run and help a child at the same time. And we really started an event called the Dinners of Hope, where we challenged every single individual around the world to host a dinner in their own home, charge an amount as if they'd been um, out to a restaurant, and we'd show the starfish video. And we had over 14 countries participate, hundreds of thousands of people sitting down to dinner on one night to pick up their starfish. And all that is to say, at the end of it, we were able to support 22,000 orphan and vulnerable children by the time I left. Um, with school fees, uniforms, psychosocial support, um, and, and education. Um, but I'm going to say this to you. When I started, I had no money. And for six months, um, I just volunteered. I was catching taxis, trying to figure out the sign language, and um, just trying to hack it out and, and, and figure this thing out. And the only thing I think people bought was the idea that all of us can make a difference, and my passion. And that's honestly how we started Starfish in South Africa. It was passion and it was a new idea. Um, and so just always remember that. It's getting a good idea, it's being passionate about it, making all the sacrifices that, that, that come with it. You typically don't have money up front, but you just work at it anyway. Um, and, and, and then mobilizing people around you and eventually the money will come. Okay, Richard Branson has a fabulous saying, do good, have fun and the money will come. I believe it. But the interesting thing is, and I'm going to get onto the Branson Centre now, is uh, Richard Branson became one of my donors, which was incredible. So he came on and he supported our organisation and funded it and got to know me a little bit over there and, and got to know the children, became very passionate about South Africa. Um, and it's amazing, full circle. So this is just another little tip. Don't burn bridges, guys. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it's difficult. I know, I've been there. Especially if you're an entrepreneur. Your idea is always better than someone else's. Of course you know better. But the reality is, is you don't know what lies down the road. I thought I would do Starfish forever. I didn't know that actually one day I'd be asked by Richard Branson to head up the Branson Center of Entrepreneurship. But just because we built a good relationship with them, because we built a good relationship with Virgin, we were a good steward of their finances. Um, they actually got to know us. So build relationships, guys. You all have amazing personalities. Don't hide them away. Use your personalities. Use your boldness. Use your sense of humor. Everything is sitting within you, guys. Everything is sitting within you. Just let it shine.